worship this morning and praise to our God and Father in Christ. Amen. Love to give him praise and honor and glory. You know, that's really why we come together on the first day of the week. And, and, I, and I understand that, you know, whenever I read the Bible and try to find what God wants us to do, it, it's always an, an encouragement to me whenever I can come together and worship with my brothers and sisters in Christ and feel that oneness and to know that, that we can do that because God loves us and cares for us and all the blessings that he's given us and to come and say thank you, Father, for, for what you've done for just a few moments a week. But that's what he's asked us to do, is to come together and praise and worship and, and to, to study together and to share in God's word, to partake of the Lord's Supper. And, and it makes me, <clears throat> over the years, I've wondered, you know, why is it that, that, that we have allowed the world to beat us down? Why is it that we've allowed the world and the society that we live in make us uncomfortable with being who we're supposed to be for being Christians? Why do we allow the world to keep us from being proud of who we are? This morning I mentioned some colleges that we're all encouraged by. I mean, we all follow them. You know who you are. You know, if you're if you're a if you're a frog, you know you're gonna give the frog sign, and if you're an Aggie, you're gonna give the whoop. And you know that they're a bunch of weirdos anywhere down. No, I'm just kidding. If you're a Longhorn, you're gonna you're gonna hook them horns, and and uh, you know if you're from K State, you're gonna. And if you're a Texas Tech, you're gonna guns up. And all those are great things, and it brings us camaraderie, and we know who each other are. However, I do want to say something to those Aggies who say that the right, you know, the Lord will uh, cut the horns off the unrighteous. It, you know, they, they, they misquote that passage because right below it it says, and it will restore the horns to the righteous. I'm sorry. But why, you know, when we do that, it's, it's good stuff. It's in good nature. But we've allowed the world, however, to take away our our joy in a sense. And they've, they've stopped us from attempting great things for God. And I've often wondered, why is that? So as I've done that, I wanted to, to look at what God says in his word. In Nehemiah 8 and verse 10, this day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Y'all remember singing that just a few moments ago? The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the lo joy of the Lord is my strength. I don't know about you, but that's exciting. But we know we should always be joyful, even in spite of the situations and, and circumstances that our society throws upon us. And so as we do that, we have to understand what God wants us to do. And I want you to listen. If you have your Bibles and want to read along, that's fine. But I'm going to read out of Romans chapter 8. And I didn't put it on the on the. On the Preso this morning on the PowerPoint because I want you to either listen or read it for yourself. So if you're just listening, close your eyes. If you're reading out of your Bibles or off your phone Bibles, whatever, just, just read along with me. Romans chapter 8, we're going to begin in verse 18. Paul writing to the church at Rome. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject to frustration not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly 
as we wait eagerly for our adoption as son, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings and words we cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. For God, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. This is a holy, this day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy that helps us through times in our lives is unlike any joy we, we can ever imagine. It can hold us up and sustain us through our deepest times of grief. I'm always excited when I attend and listen to the what, I, the what I'm saying because it's going to sound kind of funny. I'm always excited whenever I attend a funeral that is not a funeral but a celebration of someone's life. Do you understand what I'm saying, the difference there? You know, where the people, yes, are grieved, and they're going to be grieved because, I'm going to be honest with you, it's sad to lose somebody. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. But I, I, I'm excited when I go, and I know it's going to be a celebration of life. Somebody's, somebody's life meant something. And the people are there to, to honor that person and, and to give them honor and glorify and praise God for the life that they had. Now, now understand, I'm not saying that we don't grieve and that there aren't tears shed. There are. But I want you to know that when my mother-in-law died, we celebrated. Not that she was dead, but we celebrated the life that she had. I love my mother-in-law. She was like my mother to me. Some people say, yeah, I, I celebrated when my mother-in-law died too. I don't mean that at all. She was near and dear to my heart. Same way with my father-in-law. Same way with my mother some people you can just celebrate their life, what they've done, because you know that they're in a better place and they're excited to be there. And there's no doubt. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. There's joy in that. Not that we're not gonna cry, not that we're gonna get, not gonna get upset, but I want you to know that whenever we have celebrated something that has lived and is living again, that's time for celebration, to realize how important that is. Jesus even asked our Father in his own life when he was here on this earth, he knew times were going to come when it was going to be tough. He knew that there were going to be hard times. But notice what he says here in John 17, verse 13. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Jesus prayed for his disciples and said, God, I know I'm coming home. And I'm excited about coming, but I'm saying these things to you because I want those who are going to be left behind to be happy. I want them to have joy and realize what their lives are all about. In John 16, verse 22, so with you now is your time of grief. So there's a time for grief. But I will see you again, he tells them, and you will rejoice and no one will will take away your joy. How do we attempt great things for God? By not allowing people in this world to take away our joy. 
It's a wonderful thing to do, to live the kind of life. There's no one who can take away our joy. Folks, that is a promise from God. Nobody can take away your joy. If you're down about being a Christian or you're, you're not spiritually motivated, it's not because anybody's taken your joy away. It's that you've not claimed it. It's time for you to claim the joy of the Lord and to realize that everything that's happening in this world is only temporary. Even though it feels like it's gonna kill you, even though sometimes it feels like it's more than you can bear, you're depressed, you, you, you just, you, your family feels like it's falling apart, God said, that's okay, hang on to your joy because it's gonna get better. I mean, what a promise. The words that are spoken to those he warned were going to be beaten and killed and robbed and murdered and taken everything away from them, persecuted in the way that God's people had been from the prophets to the Son of God. It's going to happen. There's going to be bad things that happen. There are going to be things that happen in this world where the world thinks it's taking, you know, it's taking away your joy, and we're going to fall into that trap. We're going to think, the world is taking away my joy. I just can't, you know, my son Tony used to say, I, God intended for me to be happy. I asked him for book, chapter, and verse. I said, show me that one because I've got more that say I'm supposed to have joy in my heart and that will make me happy than it says that God will make me happy and therefore joy will come into my heart. Doesn't work that way. God never promised us happiness. That comes after death. Joy is what we have now. And it's the joy of the Lord, and it is our strength if we'll allow it to be. Do you have that type of joy in your heart? The joy that's able to overcome all that persecution that we deal with? According to Paul in Romans chapter 8, we're living in a suffering world. We live in a world of suffering, a broken world. A world that we don't understand full of trouble, persecution, and he tells us how we're to live in that world. Where does he do that? In Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Finding joy in a suffering world. All things, good and bad. I mean, how can we attempt great things for God? First, by realizing that the things that happen to us that are bad will work for our good and the kingdom's good. How? Well, if we'll allow the word of God to work in our lives, the bad things, when they happen, are not just bad. They're bad things, of course, and we can't change that, but they're things that will lead us to be closer to him. Second, the good things that happen to us will never leave us. These are the reasons that we have to be joyous. In Romans chapter 8, 28 again, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his promise. There's a few things that we need to realize as Christians that is why we need to attempt great things for God. And this is the reason for the joy that we are supposed to have as God's children because the bad things that happen will work for our good. He says that right here. Did you notice in all things, good and bad? Everything, everything will work. It'll all work. All these things happen to the children of God, to the family, to their families, to the family of God. It's gonna to happen to those who love him and those that we love. Our father said that he makes the sun rise on the just and the unjust and the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. He treats humanity the same. He gives that blessing to every person who lives on this earth for the sole purpose of bringing him honor and glory so that people can look and say, where'd that come from? And somebody can say, that came from God. Our circumstances are no worse than anyone else's. And it's essential that we understand this if we're going to uh, have this. All things will work for good does not mean bad things will not happen. It means that our joy will not be taken away. There are many things in our world, or there are many in our world, excuse me, who believe that if you're a child of God, then the bad things will be lessened from those who are non-Christians. 
You may be sitting here this morning thinking that. I shouldn't have these bad problems. I'm better than those who don't have Christ. That's not from Scripture. God does not teach that. Our circumstances are no worse than anyone else's. But believing in God and following his word, being a part of the Christian family will not stop bad things from happening to good people. All things will work for good does not mean bad things will not happen. It means that our joy will not be taken away. Notice joy, not happiness. It's crucial that we know this. And folks, we need to praise God that when good comes, when that spiritual joy and good things happen, it is because of the promise of God. God promised those things to happen. If good happens, if good appears, it is because God is working in our lives. That's why we need to attempt great things for God. If we don't attempt them, God can't bless them. And if we don't attempt them, then we're not allowing God to be God in our own lives. I mean, things are going to go away, but the children of God and their spiritual wealth will never go away. This building, someday, if God allows this earth to live long enough, is going to be gone. And so are we. And if we allow ourselves to think about that future event and forget that God's in control, then we've taken on God's part. Of life. It's like this when we experience love, when someone is there to hug us, to hold our hand, someone to love us in spite of all of our flaws, I'm going to be honest with you. I believe it is because God is bringing those people into our lives. We need to attempt great things for God as He's given us all good and perfect gifts. I mean, you remember the story of Lazarus? I mean, think about this. Did Jesus know that he was going to raise Lazarus from the grave? Yeah. Then why did he cry? If he knew that Lazarus was going to be raised from the dead and he was going to do it, why did he cry? It says Jesus wept. Why would he do that if he knew he was going to raise him from the dead? Because Lazarus Knew, I mean, he knew Lazarus was going to have to die again. You suffered through it once, Lazarus. Guess what? I'm fixing to raise you from the grave, and guess what's going to happen? You're going to have to suffer through it again. And next time, I'm not going to be there to raise you from the dead. Mary, Martha, I'm not going to be there. He didn't tell him that. He didn't have to. But he felt it, and he cried and he mourned, and he wept. God will allow bad things to happen, and good will come from them, but they're still bad things. See, the promise from God is not that if you love him and attempt great things for him, good's going to happen. He's also saying that bad things are going to happen as well, and some of them are going to be really bad things. But those things... He will take them, and he'll work them for good. Now, keep in mind that all things work together for good. They will happen. Yes, they're going to happen to me, to you, and to our brethren throughout the world. And then until we understand this, we're going to continually be let down, despaired, and defeated. And when we attempt great things for our God, our bad things, which are really bad, We'll work together for good. And the good things that can happen and that do happen will never be lost. He'll give us that joy. Give us that peace. There's something that so many of us, I believe, miss in verse 28 of Romans chapter 8. It's a three-letter word. Sometimes when we attempt to do things for God and they don't work out, we think and believe that there's something wrong with us and that there's no way good can come from us because we're not perfect and we're not able to do. And and we think about that and we think, well, if this is bad, it's going to create bad. And we get upset and we get worried. 
But there's that three-letter three little word that unites the complete meaning of what God wants us to understand. And that little letter, three-letter word is for. Did you notice how it was used in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28? And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Why? For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. God does not promise us better circumstances in life if we love him. He promises us a better life in the next life. I had a guy tell me one time, he said, I'm a Christian now, and he says, I'm suffering more than I've ever suffered in my life. I thought things were supposed to get better. Things are getting worse. They're getting harder. Is our faith in this world or our faith in the world to come? The scriptures are speaking of a total joy, a peace of, in life that goes beyond circumstances that we face in this world. We can't let the world get us down. Christ did not suffer so that we wouldn't have to. He suffered so that when we suffer, we can become like him. In this world, John says in 1 John 4, 17, in this world, we are like Jesus. God does not promise us that we are, that, that we are his, and, and if we are, that we'll have better life circumstances. He promises us a better life after this life. All things work together for good for those who are his. Why? So that we will be conformed to the likeness of his son. See, all these things work together for good. For those who love him so that we will be more like him on earth. Folks, to be a true, God, true child of God, a true follower, is to become passionately in love with Jesus and his father and be led by his spirit. And when we attempt these great things for God, no matter what they are, we will succeed in some and we will fail in some. But our joy will never be taken away from us unless we offer it up and give it up. God will take every circumstances and he will work good for us through them. Doesn't mean he's gonna take care of it, make it go away. It's just that good's gonna come from it. I mean, does that sound like a good thing or even a great thing? It does to me. Why should I want to attempt great things for God? Because my God said that I'm bigger than anything you'll ever face. My God says that he is the creator of this world. He said, and if you're my child, I'm going to take care of you no matter what. And no matter what happens to you on this earth, if you're my child, whenever this life is over, you're coming home. I used to love to listen to my mother yell out my name, Brett. Come home. I can't sound like her. And my daddy would whistle. I'd do it, but he'd burst her eardrums. I could tell my dad's whistle from almost a mile away. It's a loud whistle, but he did it, and I could hear him. My mile away back when I was five was about 200 yards, by the way, just so you know. But I could hear that whistle. I knew it was time to come home. And that's what God's doing with the joy in our lives. He's telling us, get ready. One of these days is going to be time to come home. And all these things that you're having to fight through and hold on to and that are putting you down and, and you're feeling bad about it, he said, they're going to go away and I'm going to bring you home. In Romans chapter, I think my battery died, Lisa, if you would hit that next slide there. Or is it dead too? There it goes. Whoops. Notice this. Romans 8, verse 30. And those he predestined, those that he said were going to become his children, he also called. He said, come, be with me. And those he called, he also justified. And when we come to him and we're given that fresh new life, life freed of sin, those he justified, he also glorified. We're already... We're already members 
of God's family. We're already there. We're already a part of his life. We're going to be glorified. God is not going to allow you to attempt great things and not be there for you. We have an unconditional loving relationship with God. We have an unconditional relationship with our families and with the church. And we become spiritually rich and in him. And being rich in spirit, if we truly strive to understand who and whose we are in him, he says, I will be your joy. Paul isn't promising us better things in this life if we'll do what God asks us to do. He's promising us better endings. That's why I said I can go to somebody's funeral where there's a celebration of life because I know that they're going to be with the Lord and that they're celebrating that. An ending. But with each ending, there comes a new beginning. And every new beginning should bring us more joy. Why should I attempt great things for God? I'm going to tell you why. Because I can't lose because I'm a child of God. Are they all going to work? No. Are they all going to be a blessing to everybody if I attempt something great? No. No. But he says, that's okay. On a highway going to Denver, back in 1978, I'm sorry, 77, December of 77, my brother-in-law and I and his family and my wife, Lisa, we were driving along. As we were driving along, he asked me, he said, Britt, I'm getting tired. Can you drive for a while? I said, sure. So I got in the front seat, and he trusted me. He put me in, in, the, car, in the driver's seat with his family and his sister in the car, and we're driving along, and I changed lanes, and I felt the car kind of swerve funny. I thought, man, is there ice on the ground? There was snow on the ground across. And I thought, man, what happened? And I pulled back over, and I got in the, in the slow lane on the right-hand side, and as I did... We had a blowout on the back right tire. Got out to change the tire, had to take everything out of the trunk, got the kids out of the car, jacked it up, took the car, tire off, put the spare on, let the jack down, the spare tire was low. I said, Eldon, so let me ask you a question. Did you forget to air up your tire? And he looked down and said, yeah. We took it off, rolled it down the highway about a half a mile, jumped a fence with this tire, ran up to this closed filling station, hoped that the air was on, and sure enough, it was. Big old dog sitting on the porch of this house next to it, and he just sat there and he just looked at us. I thought, you know, I'm going to get this tire filled up and I'm going to hear and I'm going to run we got up there we filled the tire up no gauge, no air gauge rolled it back down, dog never moved I think he was frozen got the tire on the car and we drove into Denver or drove into Colorado Springs and we got, got it finished aired up and we got it where it was safe again Eldon came up and said, I'm sorry. He said, I didn't prepare well. I said, man, I'm just glad that we were all there together. See, the joy wasn't lost because something tragic could have happened. The joy wasn't lost because he was not prepared as well as he could have been. The joy wasn't lost because we knew that there was more to it than what we had given it. We knew we were going to be all right anyway. I never doubted for a second that we wouldn't be all right. You're looking at this and you're saying, you know, well, I would have been all right too. I mean, there was no big deal. I don't understand why things happen. But God can work them out for good. You say, how did you do that? I'm going to tell you. I never go on a trip without checking the air pressure of my spare tire. 
And if I go anywhere with anybody else, I always ask. Things that happen to us make us better people, better prepared. And until we attempt things for God, we cannot. We cannot question until we've tried. It's time we attempt some great things individually for God. Step out in faith. Be the man, the woman, the Christian that you need to be and attempt great things for God. Sing this song this morning only. Only. If you can do so with the spirit of understanding. If not, think about the words. See what you can do about letting God know that you're ready to attempt great things for him. Because see, in doing so, it's saying, God, we're ready to come home. This morning, the invitation is yours. And if you need to come and respond in any way, make sure that you do it now while we